Pokemon. The biggest franchise ever. A series that has managed to hook people in with the ideas of collection and competition being seamlessly blended together, all while managing to breach the age gap between young and old players alike. Simple enough for a child to learn, complex enough to host worldwide tournaments, and yet still casual enough for people to just fall in love with their unique designs. It is one of, if not the most beloved franchises in history. However, you wouldn't be mistaken if you thought otherwise after viewing discussion around the subject as of late. The Pokemon games have been sailing through the waves of money that each generation of games produces each year, but this year seems to have been different. Last year at E3, the developers of the Pokemon games, Game Freak, announced the next generation of the franchise, Pokemon Sword and Shield. And as with every Pokemon game announcement, the internet ate it up in the usual way, by making massive amounts of porn of the new cute baby starters, and maybe a sheep or two. However, this announcement didn't show off any revealing footage, so everyone remained hopeful until a few months later when the first official trailer was revealed, and... It was fine enough. I mean, the diehard Pokemon fans were losing their shit over it, that's just what fans do, but to the rest of the world, there wasn't anything exactly mind-blowing about the trailer to win anyone over who wasn't already interested in the games. But for those of us who were interested, there were a few new features that seemed intriguing. First, carrying over from the previous Pokemon spin-off, Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, random encounters were removed or at least reduced with the addition of wild areas. Large open fields where Pokemon would wander freely as the player explores, allowing the player to take their own pace when exploring, and removing the randomized factor whenever players were looking for a particular Pokemon. The second big addition was something called Dynamaxing, where the Pokemon just gets really big for a short while. Personally, I think this addition is kind of lame, since it's basically just increasing the size of the Pokemon's model while adding a few flashy effects, without really changing anything significant. That is on most Pokemon. A small amount of Pokemon will get a drastic change in design and ability, with this being called Gigantamaxing. And these definitely are more interesting, if extremely limited. Oh, and I guess there was like curry or something. It all seemed pretty fine, another bog standard Pokemon adventure with a few new gimmicks added to make it seem like they were doing something new to the video game series that has stagnated for the last three generations. That is, until some shocking news was released. Pokemon Sword and Shield would not have a national dex. <gasps> now, if you're watching this video, then I can assume that you understand what this means, but allow me to enlighten those of you who have yet to ascend to the oppressed gamer society that we all live in. At this point, there are nearly 1,000 Pokemon, and of course, not every Pokemon has a home in every region that the games take place in. The Pokemon that live within the local area make up the regional decks, while every Pokemon that has ever been created makes up the national decks. Sword and Shield not having the national decks means that only about half of all Pokemon are going to end up in the game, and that is objectively a damn shame. The cool thing about Pokemon is that every Pokemon is someone's favorite Pokemon, and so guaranteeing that some people's favorite Pokemon won't be in the game is just an unfortunate choice. Speaking of choice, that also means that the player's options have been greatly reduced as well, and removing player choice is almost never a good thing, at best it's neutral. As soon as news spread about the National Dex removal, something was triggered within the Pokemon fanbase. A large amount of people suddenly began to realize that, hey, this series has kind of stagnated for a while, and instead of making significant improvements to the game, Game Freak is taking away a large chunk of what made players really enjoy Pokemon to begin with, the wide variety and flexibility of team management. With the nostalgia goggles firmly snatched away, more and more people were beginning to see the trailer in a different light. You know, that wild area that they were advertising. It seems kind of barren and empty. And those environmental details, they, they look kind of sloppy. Like this tree, for example. Boy, do Pokemon fans hate this tree. It is extremely rigid and is very obviously lacking the polygons needed for a high resolution game object to be rendered smoothly. And these textures, they're blurry and ugly, especially when compared to other games coming around the same time on the same console with less popular franchises. And these animations, maybe they were passable on weaker systems like the 3DS, but now they're on the Switch and they stand out like a sore thumb. The Pokemon animations have never looked more mediocre. It became very clear that Pokemon usually have about three animations total during a fight, and they would usually just bounce around or turn back and forth to portray moves. 
Making this extra embarrassing is the fact that Pokemon Stadium, a game that came out two decades before, managed to make very unique and interesting attack animations for a variety of moves. A popular example being this one of Kabutops using Mega Kick. I come to think of it, why exactly did Game Freak say they were removing so many Pokemon in the new game? We already have well over 800 Pokemon species, and there's going to be more added in these games. And now that they're on the Nintendo Switch, we're creating it with much higher fidelity with higher quality animations. Higher quality animations. Well, this doesn't bode well. From this point on, the situation only began to sour more and more. Long, heated arguments were made from both sides. Those against Sword and Shield saying that we should not be accepting a mediocrity and that we should demand higher quality from the series we love. And then those who still love Sword and Shield saying that we need to be kind and respectful and thankful that Game Freak is even putting out a game for us. That the problems are only minor and that we wouldn't miss those Pokemon anyway. What, what, you're telling me that you're gonna miss fucking Luminion? I bet you didn't even know Luminion existed before I brought it up. Debates at this point were getting crazy. Hell, I've seen entire YouTube careers rise from the earth based solely on disproving Pokemon apologists, and it only got worse from there. People began to notice that the models were strikingly similar from previous models on the 3DS games, which were initially created in a higher quality than the 3DS actually needed in order to future-proof the models for future games. But the new game's director states that the models for Sword and Shield were remade to match the proposed quality needed for the Nintendo Switch. Well, that's just baffling. Why would they need to make new models after spending so much time, effort, and money future-proofing ones years ago. And if they did remake them, then why do they look exactly like the previous ones? This is at best a misplaced effort and at worst an outright lie. And all these proposed changes were in exchange for half the Pokemon that could have been in the game. More and more game footage of the game was released and limited animation for people and Pokemon remained constant. The gameplay was confirmed to be restricted at 30 frames per second instead of the preferred 60. Previously introduced features like Mega Evolution and Z-moves seemed to never show up. The Pokemon that were receiving new Gigantamax forms were mostly advertised to show several Gen 1 Pokemon that have already been beaten into the ground due to how much they've been exposed to us already. Pokemon sizes were unusually scaled as to make them seem smaller than they actually are, or as they were depicted in previous games. Noticeable pop-in and graphical glitches started being shared, as well as intense slowdown during busier moments. The EXP share, which had previously rendered Pokemon games a mindless breeze due to how they made the player ridiculously overpower the casual play, has become a permanent feature now, with no option to turn it off. The game was recorded to be fairly short and easy by those who had somehow gotten an early copy of the game, and it was confirmed that the post-game, which had usually been lacking in Pokemon games lately, will continue the trend of being short and bland. Several of the game's cutscenes were shown to be embarrassingly anticlimactic due to bad animations. Along with the Pokemon that were cut, a series of Pokemon moves were also taken out of the game. And all this is being served to the loyal fans at a price $20 more expensive than what was sold to us on the 3DS. As well as the fair assumption that we wouldn't even be getting a completed game due to Game Freak's tendency to re-release finished versions of the same game the next year. But hey, at least we can skip the catching Pokemon tutorial. I think it would be fair to say that the fans' outrage reached its climax when the models were extracted from early copies of the games and revealed to be 100% the same models from the 3DS games, and that Game Freak had outright lied to the public whenever they said why they removed half the Pokemon. So now, the animations weren't good, the models weren't new, and we still have no national decks. Some people say that this was just a mistranslation, that people misunderstood what Game Freak was actually trying to say due to a translation error. Other people would say that we can't trust these images because they're not legitimate, they were posted by anonymous sources on 4chan. I'm gonna leave it up to you, the listener, to decide whether or not you think that these claims are valid. But one thing is an objective fact, there are only half the Pokemon in the game. After the news was released, hashtag Game Freak Lied became trending on Twitter for a solid few days, ironically coming right after your hashtag Thank you Game Freak came out from the more positive fans. This is likely the heaviest amount of criticism Game Freak has ever received in regards to Pokemon, and according to news outlets, morale was at a new low in the company. 
Of course, like any group, there are people who went too far, choosing to directly harass anyone who works at Game Freak and even the owner of Cerebi.net, a Pokemon information website, for some reason. And uh, I just might I add, um, if you do this, you're fucking disgusting. Hundreds of Pokemon videos began being uploaded, like uh, um, uh, the one you're watching right now. And Pokemon forums became ablaze with criticism and vitriol. While a solid number of fans remained loyal to Game Freak or just simply wanted to play the game regardless or in denial of the criticism, never more had so many people been turned against Pokemon, and that's including a period where some people actually tried to say the game was demonic. Your children knew, need to know there's a devil, and he hates them, and he wants to ruin their life. But was it all valid? You read the title of this video, so you should know what my personal opinion on it was. I love Pokemon. I've played every generation except for the fifth, several spin-offs. I've watched the show, I collected the cards, and I have been purchasing the new games despite not being truly happy with them since Gen 4. But I am kind of relieved to see this much attention being thrown towards Pokemon's flaws. I have no idea what, if anything, Game Freak is going to do to combat the criticism in the future, but the first step is getting enough people to demand change. In fact, my best guess on what's going to happen next is that despite news articles saying that Game Freak has no intention of re-adding the national decks, they're probably going to add them back and everyone's just going to forget this whole fiasco even happened. Even though we were just being given what should have been there in the first place and that Pokemon can still improve beyond it. Before Pokemon was such a bloated franchise, they literally couldn't help but release hastily produced products due to all the subsequent merchandise, anime, trading cards, and everything else attached to Pokemon's growth. But maybe, just maybe, now something will happen to increase quality and win back the fans that the games lost. Game Freak is a small, and I mean small, company. A company of about 150 people. The contrast, a AAA company like let's say Ubisoft Montreal, has about 3,500 employees, and it is still able to release large scope games every year despite games not being part of literally the most profitable franchise ever. Game Freak can grow, Game Freak should grow, in order to meet the demands of such a popular and highly demanded game series. Like the games, dislike the games, this is an honest truth. Pokemon is not reaching its full potential. You know Pokemon can be better. So why do you prefer it stagnate? But I doubt any of this will really matter. If you haven't been convinced before, then I'm probably not going to change your mind. Also, if you clicked on this video based on its title, then there's a good chance you already agree with my opinions. The main reason I made this video was to give more of a realistic perspective on the game from a person who is very cynical about the franchise. At the time of writing, reviews for the game have already been released, and it's very clear that most of them are definitively positive, some of them even going out of the way to say that all the fans who are complaining are just babies. In fact, IGN said that this was probably the best Pokemon to date. Like most of you, I don't take these forms of criticism that seriously. Not because they're completely ignoring all the problems that the fans have, and even now I'm pretty sure the Pokemon isn't really a flawed game. It still has all the fundamentals that have been in place since the very beginning, and they still work fine. My problem is that these reviews never seem to look at the larger picture. At this point, we know what Pokemon is and how it works. We also know what the games can be because we've seen previous titles be better and worse. When every game is basically the same, it's the small differences that really change everything. So. Are you unhappy with Pokemon lately? Are you boycotting and wondering if you're missing anything worthwhile? Well, allow me to explain in as reasonable a fashion as I possibly can my own personal experience with the game, despite being someone who has not been truly satisfied with an official Pokemon game since Diamond and Pearl. This isn't going to be a full-on dissection of the game to figure out any and every flaw, this is going to be how I felt while playing the game, and whether or not the previously discussed leaks proved problematic and were noticeable to a fairly casual player like myself. Let's cynically review Pokemon Shield. I debated whether or not to make this review spoiler free, but then I realized it's a fucking Pokemon game and if you can't predict the ending by the halfway point then you are probably a literal child and shouldn't be watching this video. So yeah, spoiler warning for a game that doesn't have a good storyline. Also there are some base level enjoyment factors that are inherent in every Pokemon game. Building a team and watching them grow is still fun, but if that's the only thing that you cared about then you've already bought the game regardless. 
I'm not going to go into detail about how Pokemon still is not a bad game because it isn't. This is to compare it to previous versions. Starting at the beginning, a problem Pokemon has had, especially as of late and especially in Sun and Moon, was the story taking too much time to get through and forced tutorials slowing the game to a halt for old players. This game certainly has a lengthy beginning, but the tutorials seem to have been toned out at least a little. You can skip things like the catching tutorial, but you can't skip the setup with the dialogue introductions on the concept of catching Pokemon. Still, it's a better situation than Sun and Moon, and for the record, I did like Sun and Moon despite the intro. We are quickly introduced to nearly all of the key characters, with the most important ones being Sonya, an information-obsessed Pokemon professor in training, Leon, the current champion and superstar to the public, and his little brother named Hop, who plays the role of rival in this game. The rivals in Pokemon games have slowly gotten worse over time, losing the snarky, antagonistic personality that makes players want to fight them, and instead providing support and cheering the player on. And a majority of people who bring this up seem to really hate this. Hop is basically no different. In fact, a lot of fans seem to really, really hate him, going as far as to call him the worst rival yet. To which I say, uh, have you played X and Y? No, he isn't the worst rival. In fact, I think he has more development than most ever get. He's a sibling to the best trainer in the region and desires to reach the same heights as his brother. But in doing so, he pushes himself too far and never seems to get that extra mile needed to be exceptional, often making him come off as depressed with how many times he keeps getting his ass handed to him. In the end, he chooses to accept that he won't become the best and instead decides to become a Pokemon professor in order to do what he really enjoys doing instead of trying to live up to expectations higher than he can manage. Uh, unfortunately, he chooses to do this after the hardest battle in the game, but I guess being the second best trainer in Galar isn't enough for him? Does that mean he's good? Hell no, he's still bland as hell and the amount of times we have to run into him and battle his weak ass Pokemon is very tiresome. But he isn't the worst. He also still picks the starter that is weak to your Pokemon, which I, I just don't understand the logic of. And speaking of logic I don't understand, the audio settings for this game were hidden behind an optional NPC where most players would pass over them. What a, what a bizarre choice. After Leon gives us our choice for a starter, we're allowed to battle Pokemon and explore the town. Starting off, I'd like to say that this game looks fine. It isn't as high quality or expansive as the other games on the Switch, but the towns often capture a particular style that meshes well with the simplistic game they exist in. Low quality textures were not that obvious when the entire game has low quality textures, which is also why things like this hat stands out because it really, really looks bad, even compared to everything else in the game. What is less favorable though is the obnoxious poppins for everything in the overworld. As players, we are given the ability to see far in the distance at times, but this ends up being worthless as all the interactable objects aren't in our view until we get closer. This problem gets worse in other scenarios though, so I'll save it for them. Some of these towns in this game look truly great. A standout being the town located in the middle of a fairy forest. It's just a shame that there's so little to do in these areas. With the previously mentioned spot containing like two buildings and a gym. Half of these towns suffer from the classic Pokemon games problem where they don't feel big enough to justify their existence. Pallet Town consists of three buildings, and that hardly makes up a town. But those games were limited by their hardware. Once the series jumped to 3DS, we saw immediate improvements and towns turned on to full-on cities. I don't know why Sword and Shield chose to regress so many areas down, and even the bigger cities are often shallow once you really explore them. They pull out this like hotel gimmick like three times in order to include a bunch of rooms at once where something might actually happen. I'd say about half the towns in this game are lackluster, and that's disappointing. Another point of contention before the game's release were the battle animations, and while they certainly aren't spectacular, most of them do the job. What was hidden from the public is the fact that animations are selectively good. Certain movements and effects look great, it's just a shame that everything can't look that lively. Before getting to the gameplay, let me give you a brief rundown of how I like to play Pokemon games. I have two goals. One, make a solid team of Pokemon I like, and two, catch all the Pokemon in the regional decks. I do not go out of my way to do anything to boost my Pokemon stats beyond basic battles, and I do try to battle every single trainer in the game, but I don't grind by fighting wild Pokemon. However, I do try to catch every single Pokemon on the route while I'm on it, and in recent games, catching Pokemon still grants your party EXP, so I still get tons of EXP from wild Pokemon. But I never use rare candies or the new EXP candies on my own Pokemon, just ones I'm trying to evolve for the deck's completion. 
I also decided to play this entire game in set mode instead of switch, meaning that I'm not able to switch out Pokemon after I defeat one. I did this because I saw some people on Twitter said that they did this and they claimed they make the difficulty more challenging. Lastly, I used a Twitter poll to choose my starter and it ended up being Score Bunny, the fire type. To summarize how this playstyle worked out, Cinderace carried my entire team for the entirety of the game. Despite surprisingly not being a fire fighting type, Cinderace still gets to have physical attack and learns both fire and fighting moves. This made a majority of gym leaders, rival fights, team fights, villain fights, and everything else a breeze. And even if somebody did have a type advantage against me, I usually had a move or something to get around it and still deal massive damage back. Fights took no strategy whatsoever, and the fact I had Pokemon other than Cinderace seemed more like a formality than a strategic decision. In this game, I never lost a battle once. I even had to add an additional restriction where I never used any items in battle, only outside. I got close to losing once, but that was because I forgot to change my party from Pokemon I was leveling up to evolve for the Pokedex. But technically, I have to say that the difficulty scaling was surprisingly balanced. For about half the game, I was still relatively close to the same level as my opponents. It wasn't until the later half of the game in which I began to catch more and more Pokemon, where my party became more powerful because of it. Gym battles have returned, getting rid of those awful totem Pokemon from Sun and Moon. This time they're presented as giant events held in stadiums with an enormous audience watching them take place. This seems like a natural progression of gyms, and they make a lot more sense in the world of Pokemon, where gym leaders are seen as celebrities and not just noteworthy people of a certain profession. They still work like gyms used to, involving the player completing some sort of trial before reaching the leader. These trials range from mildly engaging to tedious with no effort whatsoever. The trial for the dragon type gym leader is literally just three trainers back to back in a room. Compare that to something like this weird pinball game that is awkwardly interrupted by battles after each piss easy section. Overall these gyms are pretty boring and instead of having unique designs based around their type, they're just open areas consisting of one basic color. There is one thing I think is good about them though. You can't leave a gym once you start, which means that there's no going back to the Pokemon Center to heal after each battle. It makes the gyms feel more like a challenge, or at least they would if you didn't have the ability to buy a bunch of potions and carry them in with you. This is also the introduction of the version specific gyms, which I think is a great idea on paper. If Game Freak is going to sell us two versions of the same game, then any changes between each version to justify two versions existing at once is welcome to me. Unfortunately, it would seem that these version specific gyms are somewhat haphazard. Nearly every gym leader plays some sort of role outside of their gym, even if it's small and forgettable. Except for the version specific ones. It is obvious that they were made to be easily able to swap them out for their respective versions, and they don't have any sort of impact outside of their gyms. This makes the version specific gym leaders very forgettable. The newest feature that has been hyped up in gyms is Dynamax. And no way around it, Dynamax is a fucking mess and I hate it. It's a less interesting version of Mega Evolution, except now it has longer, unskippable intros, and it only lasts for three turns. To make things worse, you can only use Dynamax in gyms, no using it outside of battles or against random trainers. We are basically talking about like eight fights in the entire game that allow Dynamax. While you could Mega Evolve whenever, wherever, the caveat being that in Mega Evolution only certain Pokemon could Mega Evolve, but here everybody can Dynamax. Unfortunately it makes Dynamax feel a lot less special because of it though. The only interesting feature to Dynamax is the Gigantamax designs, but getting those on your team is a tedious process of itself, and I'll save that for later. I should go ahead and point out that the music in this game is actually really good. It's probably the only thing in the game that I have mainly positive things to say outside of a few sample choices here or there. Because of the stadium setting, these songs often incorporate audience cheers in a very effective way that make it feel really lively. Pretty much every character's song is incredibly memorable and I wouldn't mind listening to it on its own. The town songs are kind of samey, but those are the ones that everybody comes for. They come here to hear Marini's theme or Bede's theme, and these songs really knock it out of the park. So yeah, I don't know, good job Pokemon, you get one, one thumbs up from me. In between gyms, you will be exploring routes which have reached a new low compared to previous titles. Each route can basically be summed up as a straight line with Pokemon and trainers blocking the path. 
There is no leniency to allow for much, if any, exploration, and most hidden items are found along the route's path, or they're on a separate path that quickly circles back around to the main one. There are no secret entrances, extra areas to open up or come back to, no rebattles, and to make things worse, the few items that you do pick up are usually either worthless or are TMs. TMs in this game have been heavily nerfed as most of them are terrible. All the good moves are locked behind TRs, limited use items, and I actually like that aspect. The problem is why would I explore these routes for these shitty moves I don't want and will never use? I remember in Sun and Moon, after learning how to surf and smash rocks at the same time, I could come back to certain areas and find completely new ex places to explore. But here there's nothing! One and done! That's it! Pokemon games have also been trying to cut down on the use of HMs, and pretty much everyone agrees that forcing players to teach their Pokemon shitty HM moves that are required to progress, and which can never be removed after they've been taught, is terrible. So in Sun and Moon, they remove them and replace them with these, like, Pokemon helpers, which were used to solve the same puzzles just without the previous downsides. Sword and Shield got rid of HMs and the helpers and replaced it with... Well, nothing. You do get a bike, which is used to get to places fast and go across water, but that's it. This is another reason why routes feel so hollow, because there are no tools, no moves, no puzzles to solve like before. I'm fine with removing the Pokemon helpers, they were kind of annoying to have to register to the D-pad, but if you're going to remove them, then you should really add something in their place instead of nothing! The story to this game is probably the weakest yet. After the first gym battle, there's little going on outside of you just beating gyms. We're introduced to Chairman Rose, who is clearly not a secret bad guy and has obviously not an evil character and obviously not a shitlord working for him. This guy's named Bede, by the way, or Bedi? I don't know, I don't know how you pronounce it, I don't care, I'm calling him Bede. And he serves as the real antagonistic rival that Hop should have been. Except he's so absurdly pompous that he just comes off as annoying. He isn't even a cartoonish exaggeration like Gladian was in Sun and Moon. He's just mean for the sake of mean. Even after he gets his ass handed to him, he still acts like he's better than you in every way. He also gets abandoned halfway into the game and doesn't show up until the end. And he acts very overdramatically after being taken under by the weird pink lady. Usually in Pokemon games, there are two things that provide conflict in the story outside of the player's poor desire to beat gyms. There is usually an evil team looking to cause trouble, and then there's a powerful legendary Pokemon that the team usually insists on using to cause the trouble. This game's evil team is Team Yell, a team that is practically useless and proves no threat whatsoever. They are basically Discount Team Skull, and I hate them with all of my heart. So Team Skull was kind of different as they weren't looking for world domination or whatever. They were just a bunch of thugs that were so goofy no one took them seriously. Except for the leader who led his gang efficiently. Team Yell is also just a bunch of thugs except they don't want to cause trouble for everyone. Just other gym challengers in order to get Marnie, a small goth girl that they have an unusual amount of dedication towards, ahead in the championship. Other than that they just sort of exist. This is also the last time that I'm going to be mentioning Marnie because she has no story importance whatsoever. There is literally a scene where Team Yell is watching a snake sleep on the ground because they think it's cute. Then a random person comes by and asks if they can pass, and they let her. No problems, they just let her pass. Then they inexplicably stop us because they need to remind us that they exist. They then leave and aren't brought up again for a while. The most they do in the game is apparently take over a small indoor town for some reason, and we easily get in with no trouble and just beat the gym leader there regardless. This section is so infuriating because it's so clear what they were trying to do. This was supposed to be the Galar version of Poe Town from Sun and Moon. To recap, in Sun and Moon, Team Skull take over a huge city, tear it to pieces, and turn it into a hideout. The player gets to explore around here, and there are tons of items scattered around, Team Skull members constantly patrolling the area, and they even take control of the local Pokemon Center and force you to pay to have your Pokemon healed. It was a highlight of the game. So what does Sword and Shield do with the Team Yell hideout? Well, it's a really long straight line, with a few battles sprinkled in. This also isn't a unique area like Poe Town was. This counts as both a team hideout and a gym. This is a fucking travesty. 
The other thing that seems to be missing from the story is the legendary Pokemon's involvement. As we explore Galar, we sometimes find a relic to the past and Sonya slowly deals out lore about the region. That lore is as follows. There was once two kings and they had a sword Pokemon and a shield Pokemon and they stopped something called the darkest day. The end. That's basically it, and this small amount of info is dealt out over the course of hours. And none of this is solved by the player, it's all either a coincidence or is figured out by another person. The legendary Pokemon never really show up outside of a short segment at the beginning of the game and this statue that was hidden for some reason. After you've beaten all the gyms and are about to fight the champion, Chairman Rose stops everything and says, uh, shit, guys, we forgot we're supposed to have a huge climax with some legendaries and shit. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry everyone, stop everything. We can't let you in the game yet. Let's just do this real quick and then we'll let you beat the game, okay? Let's do it. So everything just stops and we run to an embarrassingly small secret area and fight, uh, Eternatus? This Pokemon was never brought up prior to this battle and there was no build up for it. Uh, there was this one area where we literally do nothing while Chairman Rose's goons attack us in an elevator and it just results with everybody wasting their time. We learn that Chairman Rose here has heard of something called the fucking Darkest Day and somehow made the connection that it sounds really great and that it means everybody gets free power forever. Anyway, we try to fight Eternatus and we can't do shit for some unexplained reason so we pull out the MacGuffins that we found earlier and we summon the legendary dogs for this game. And this scene is admittedly really cool and the moves taking place look great and we have an exciting 4v1 battle while kick-ass music plays in the background. Or it would be kick-ass if it didn't have this annoying fucking sample of a wolf howling throughout it. All of the music associated with these legendary dogs have this howling sample and it's extremely obnoxious. The other thing that kills this fight is that it has no challenge whatsoever. Once you call the dogs to help, they do all the work and we just have to like mindlessly attack until Eternatus' huge life bar is drained. Then we catch Eternatus and the dogs fuck off. Uh, okay. So we, we don't get to catch the cover legendaries until after we beat the game? That's new, but what's the fucking point? By the time we get these Pokemon, we've pretty much already beaten the entire game, and the only thing we can use them for are optional parts of the post game. It's just a huge waste. The post game is very disappointing as well. You get a short storyline about two fucknuts with terrible hair causing trouble. And ironically, despite still being boring, this post game is better than all of the main game story. Because at least it has clear antagonists that are fun to hate and who intend to cause trouble. Still forgettable though. And then there's the battle tower and it is by far the most boring battle tower I've seen in a while. It's literally just a big, flat, empty white room while you battle rando trainers on repeat. Compare it to something like Sun and Moon where they had the battle tree. Battling in a big tree is way more interesting than a white empty room and in that game you even had a chance to meet up with trainers from previous games. In fact, you literally have to fight red and blue before getting to the tower. So I think that covers everything else that the game has to offer. Now let's talk about the biggest new addition to the game and subsequently the biggest fucking train wreck, the wild area. The wild area is a big open area where a variety of Pokemon roam. Weather constantly changes and strong Pokemon wander around offering a challenge or a rare grab, along with raid battles that are constantly being offered. Initially, this seems like a stellar idea. Even I was won over by it at first. However, it doesn't take long to notice just how poorly everything in this area was managed. First. It's ugly. There are no stylistic additions here to make it stand out like in the towns. It is basically just one huge open grassland with a few lakes and landmarks thrown about. There's also like this small desert area but this place is so small and is basically no different to anything else in the game that it may as well just be like the rest of it. It's forgettable and it has no impact on anything whatsoever. There is no variety in the world design like on the other routes. It's all just grass. 
The draw distance is also at its worst here. Wild Pokemon don't show up until you are close to them, so what is even the fucking point of being able to see so far away but not being able to see anything there? Instead, if I want to find a certain Pokemon, I have to patrol around the entire area and hope I happen to run into its range for it to become visible. And it's like completely antithetical to what its entire purpose should be. These big, strong Pokemon should be clear and openly visible for people to say, oh wow, look at that thing way over there. I want to bite or catch it. Because at least whenever a Pokemon is in the grass, it kind of makes sense that you wouldn't be able to see it until you get close to it. But these giant Pokemon are just standing out in the fucking open. So why can't I see them? I also have to patrol around for NPCs, which consist of the same three people asking for the same things over and over again. There are berry trees scattered around the map, but they're always in the same place, so I don't know why they have to pop in like everything else does. The environment is just bland and empty, and this applies to the gameplay as well. Sure, you may be able to find this neato tower surrounded by ghost type Pokemon, but you can't do anything with it besides pick up the garbage at a space. When not catching Pokemon, the only thing you can do is pick up shiny objects on the ground. After the first time you ride around the wild area, there is nothing new to look at or do. The way Pokemon are handled is actually really great for casual players, but terrible for anyone who's trying to complete the Pokédex. First, there are just too many Pokemon at once. It can be overwhelming if you're trying to catch them all. And if you do catch them all, then you're probably going to become overleveled because of the XP you get from catching Pokemon. But if you're just roaming around and trying to pick out the cutest Pokemon that you can find as a casual player, then it probably would work out great. Second, you can't catch certain levels of Pokemon without the corresponding badges. And I don't know what the point of this is. You already can't tame Pokemon outside of your level range in order to prevent you from becoming overpowered, so this is just redundant. It's also annoying that as a completionist, I can't catch everything I see. I have to actively avoid certain Pokemon. If you battle them and win, I'm sure you're going to get a good amount of EXP, but the game is already super easy without overleveled Pokemon. Why are you trying to make it easier? And these Pokemon are random, so if you see a Pokemon that you like, there is no guarantee that they will remain there once you get the badge needed to catch them. This doesn't become useful until the end game, when you probably already have a team made. And despite the nifty fact that some originally trade-only Pokemon can show up in the wild area, we have to wait until we have basically beaten the game to take advantage of them. Third is the way weather works. A casual player might find a unique weather condition in a certain area, which means that very unique and special Pokemon will come out only to them, and this makes their playthrough a lot more unique than anybody else who would have done the same thing. But completionists have to run through each weather condition randomly until they get the one they want, and then they have to catch all the Pokemon in each area in each weather form. It gets tedious. More tedious than random encounters, which of course are still kind of a thing. One of the biggest things I hate, though, is how shiny Pokemon do not show up in the overworld. That was, like, the best part of Let's Go. Spying a shiny Pokemon in the grass and the excitement that can be experienced from just wandering around. But here, for no explicable reason, they removed that and made shinies a tedious process of trial and error once again when it doesn't need to be. Overall though, I do have to say that Pokemon showing up in the overworld is a positive change. Each Pokemon displays an interesting behavior upon seeing you. Some will run away, some will attack you, some will just run right up to you because they want to play. Avoiding aggressive Pokemon is still challenging enough to justify having to wait in battle because the player was at fault, instead of random encounters wasting everybody's time. This is a great addition, it just wasn't handled properly for several portions of it. And now let's talk about the new online functionality. If you spent about $60 on this game at launch, and then another 15 or more dollars on Nintendo's online service, then you can experience the absolute horror that is the wild area while online. Anytime you are connected to the internet, you can see other players roaming around the wild area in the same area you are. Except they completely freeze while you're looking at text boxes or are paused, so none of it's actually happening in real time. And then they often fly all over the place due to the poor connection.
but what can I do with these players in the overworld, you might ask? Well, you can talk to them and get an automated response back and some useless food. That's it. They are pretty much just a visual addition. A visual addition that also tanks the frame rate and makes text boxes show up way more slowly than you'd ever want. Playing in the wild area while online is nothing short of horrible. But you'd want to be online so you don't miss out on the cards constantly being shoved in your face regardless of whether you ask for them or not. This mess is the new way that you interact with everyone else, and it sucks ass. It has a huge amount of latency, so if you see, say, a raid battle you want to join, then there's a good chance that the battle is already closed. And considering just how many players are constantly playing this game, you'd think you'd get more raid notifications for more valuable Pokemon than almost none. The by far worst aspect of this new system is the removal of the global trade system, which proved to be absolute hell for trying to complete the Pokédex alone. Before, you could just go on the GTS and look for whatever Pokemon you want or need, and try to match the trade request with complete strangers. It was efficient, and it made completing the Pokédex less tedious without removing all of the difficulty. Now though, we are back to the archaic design of having to find somebody else through means outside of the game, telling them what you want to trade, and then having to exchange codes in order to make sure you get in the same trade session. It sucked in Let's Go, it sucks here too. And I just know somebody's going to say something like, Oh, but it's just like classic Pokemon games where it's forcing you to be social in order to win. And to that I say bullshit. This might be a hot take, but that design philosophy is hot garbage and existed solely to justify selling extra game versions and accessories. I hate this new system. Lastly, there are the raid battles. Raids are where four trainers battle against a permanently Dynamaxed Pokemon. And then at the end of the battle, the player will either try to capture the Pokemon because they won, or the trainers will be kicked out because four trainers fainted in the same session. These are hard for all of the wrong reasons, and I don't see what the point is for a majority of these fights. Raid battles are the only way that you can get Gigantamax versions of Pokemon. But unless you're battling those versions, then the only thing you're getting from capturing these Dynamax Pokemon is an extra bit of HP when they Dynamax which can also be achieved by giving them this like Dynamax candy stuff. But we've also talked about how pointless Dynamax is to the overall game. You will get a set number of these fights each day and you can reset them early by clearing all the ones available to you in your wild area. Doing this though would be a real test of patience because each fight is incredibly tedious. Each fight consists of several unskippable cutscenes and having to go through six or more attacks each turn and that's not even considering that you lose and you have to start all of this over. Losing is very common because you often have to rely on computer teammates. You can start up a raid and invite random people to help you, but unless the Pokemon you're fighting is a Gigantamax type, most people won't give a shit about helping you in your battle. And that leaves you to be alone with three CPUs. The CPUs are total ass. You get three random trainers and their Pokemon are never very strong. They are also often underleveled and sometimes even weak to the raid Pokemon. What fucking genius decided to bring a goddamn Magikarp to a Kaiju fight? And then there's this kid that always uses a fucking Eevee that just uses Helping Hand while they get bodied. And then there's this fan favorite fucking Solrock. Despite the fact that Dynamax Pokemon can nullify any of the current stat changes on the field, this motherfucker decides to keep using cosmic power back to back for some reason. Thanks for wasting everybody's time, asshole. More often than not, you will lose matches because of these fuckheads and not your own mistakes. And then there's the fucking cherry on top of the shit cake. Let's say you actually managed to beat a valuable Gigantamax Pokemon that you want on your team. Now you get one chance to throw a Pokeball at it. One chance. If the Pokemon escapes the ball, then they immediately run and you just wasted 15 to 30 minutes of your fucking life. This is insane, and this is the worst waste of my fucking time in the entire game. Beating these raid Pokemon nets you a bunch of goodies, with the most valuable one being these EXP candies. These things are great for quickly leveling up Pokemon outside of battle, like perhaps you just hatched an egg and you immediately want it in fighting shape. 
Then you just give it a handful of these and boom, it just went from level one to level 50 just like that. Very nifty for a lot of stuff. But if you use these valuable candies while you're still in the main game, then congrats, you have broken the game in half. Your Pokemon will level up so fast and be so high level that they will tower over any opponent they face. And the last shred of difficulty that once existed will be gone. I'm really not a fan of constantly having to limit myself in order to get anything from these games difficulty wise. And this is just a prime example of not using what the game gives you in order to have fun. You have to play the game in a very specific way in order for it to be hard and sometimes that won't even work. And that sucks. I think there's just one more thing for me to bring up and that is Pokemon Camp. Basically, whenever you're roaming around the world, you can set up camp and play with your Pokemon and make curries for some reason. This camp is what replaced Pokemon and me from the 3DS games, and I'm not sure whether or not this is actually better or worse. Being able to pet your Pokemon is a feature that I felt really helped you connect to these pixels in a video game. It made it feel a lot more personal, like you were actually physically touching your partner Pokemon. But in the camp, you take on a less interactive role. You can now play with your Pokemon, but this essentially consists of you just waving a feather in front of them because all Pokemon are cats now, and throwing a ball and watching them fetch it. And in all honesty, this is adorable. And seeing my party interact with each other in the background was a very heartwarming moment. But it's just all so shallow for me to say that it's anything exceptional. It's also buggy as hell. There are hundreds if not thousands of videos featuring Pokemon running into walls, walking into each other, or wildly zipping around while trying to fetch a ball three feet away from them. This is definitely something I would love to see improved in future games. Then there are these curries. You can play a short mini game to heal your Pokemon, make them friendly towards you, and give them more EXP because I guess there's just not enough ways for your Pokemon to get EXP in this game. It too is shallow and not very fun. Each time you make curry, it is the same mini game over and over. I don't care for this edition and the rewards you get for completing the curry decks is just a bunch of ball types. So, no thanks. Really, this is only scratching the surface of all the things wrong with this game, but I really didn't want to do a full analysis of it. What's that? You said the video is already 50 minutes long? Whoopsie doodle. There are several problems, like how absurdly complicated it is to get previous generation Pokeballs, or how altering your Switch's time changes the weather but doesn't respawn strong Pokemon or reset raid battles. All of this game's victories are tiny ones, like the addition of autosave, which took this long to finally be implemented for some reason. So, in conclusion, is Pokemon Sword and Shield good? And was the hate before it justified? I honestly think that Sword and Shield are possibly the worst mainline Pokemon games we have received, or at least they tie with X and Y. Nearly all of the additions included are lackluster or outright bad, and all this was in exchange for better features that got abandoned. This isn't even talking about the national decks being removed, because I didn't have any problem with that whatsoever. It's certainly still a problem, but it didn't affect me at all. This is about everything currently in the game, all the things that were added that is new or revised. We also ended up spending way more money on these games than we did for anything on the 3DS, as well as having all of the online features being hidden behind a subscription service now. The game did not challenge me, and completing the Pokédex was an absolute pain due to the lack of the global trade system. The story was uninteresting and the post-game was minuscule. Really, this is a game that I dislike more and more as I think about it. And in retrospect, nearly every complaint that was expressed before the launch came to fruition and was an actual problem. My final opinion on this game is that it is a 4 out of 10. Sure, at its core it's still Pokemon, and Pokemon is still fun. But when each game is basically the same thing, it's the things that make it different that truly determine its quality. And compared to the other games, this is just a disappointment that many of us saw coming. I cannot fathom why this game got so positive reviews from outlets like IGN. It truly does not deserve such praise. I love Pokemon and I only want for it to get better, not get worse like this game has done. 
And hopefully, after all of this backlash, a sequel can improve where this game has failed, the same way that Sun and Moon did for X and Y. I'm going to remain optimistic about the future because Sun and Moon was great, X and Y wasn't, and if I just stopped playing the game at X and Y, I would have never been able to enjoy Sun and Moon. So maybe the next game in the series will be a lot better, but the game that we got right now, it's not good. It's just messy, it's outdated, it's ugly, and despite me initially having fun when playing it, that fun slowly decreased until it became pure hatred. And so I know that this is probably going to be a contentious opinion because there are several people out there who love Pokemon regardless. And if those people exist and they're watching the video, then they probably already left a dislike and they didn't even reach the end of it. But if you did, my message to you would be, please ask for better. There's nothing wrong with playing the games and enjoying them. The only time it becomes wrong is whenever you're silencing other people for having criticisms. We just want better games for everyone. And this did not live up.